Good evening, and welcome to Von Mott's Presents, Mott's Ado About Nothing. Mott's Ado About Nothing. Mott's Ado About Nothing. Where we apply the revolutionary Mott's scale to classic and contemporary literature. Mott's Ado About Nothing. Mott's Ado About Nothing. This podcast contains mature content, spoilers, language, you have been warned. Welcome back to The Lost Signals, Literary Reviews. Tonight we're doing Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable. It was first published January 1953, um, If Worlds of Science Fiction magazine, and it was the story upon which the Twilight Zone episode by the same name, Time the, Enough at Last. The eponymous tale, if you the will. The eponymous tale. Yes. Um, Eponymous. I'm Chris Morgan, and I'm here with Scott Thurlow. And I have time enough. How's it going? Jonathan Ian Manzer. How you doing? And Stephen Armosi. Uh, hopefully we have time enough to podcast. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> and Ian, dost thou have a hilarious log line? No, but I'm going to try for it. For sale, books never read. <laughs> I like Mark it. it. I think it's a good one. Beautiful. Very, very good. Scott, let's get you started. Would you like to start us off with the plot? Uh, sure. So I'm going to try as we sort of pre- discussed uh precast that i'll try to remove this from the actual episode of the twilight zone which is probably much more famous than the actual story, source story now so but the thing is it's based very heavily on it so it's not all that different so if you have seen it you've probably seen this maybe a little condensed man and henry henry bemis works in a bank his only desire is to read in this case a full book and not just snippets he's unable to do so because of his job in the bank and because of his somewhat overbearing but not like too crazy wife will say and eventually one day he's in the vault sneaking to read a magazine the bombs go off and he wanders the desolated town, realizes his dream can come true now, finds a library, picks out all the books he's going to read. His, of course, special huge thick glasses made of like fucking 10,000 layers of aluminum or whatever break. And he sits there and cries in the, an ironic ending. And that's <laughs> pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. So like the thing is, if I'll go to scores. I'm looking at a pretty solid two. Again, this has been a trend, I guess, in the last couple of um lit reviews that we've done is that these are such short stories and they get to the point so quick and like earn and out that the plot like breezes through what plot there is. I mean, there is one. It's just what I said. So it's perfectly solid. It's just that, again, maybe again by design, as we've been coming to say, or through like no fault of the story itself, generally, it doesn't really like have enough to get to a three, but certainly I'm going to give it a solid two. This is a very standard, be careful what you wish for story. Um, He wants... Time to read. He's given that time. Oops. Sure. Th- so you're saying the universe is Twist. a jackass genie, like essentially? Yeah. No, the universe is mad at him because he was basically dancing on the graves of the dead <laughs> as as he like wandered well, to the yes. library. Well, maybe that's themes, but... <laughs> Thank God everyone's dead. I can God, read I mean. now. It's weird because I, I don't... I... Don't remember the Twilight Zone. I mean, I remember the Twilight Zone episode for like the key. The highlights. Sure. I don't remember. Because they have an interesting part where he cuts his leg mm. and is mm-hmm. bleeding... Pretty bad. Mm. Has nothing uh, to do with the story. Well, here's the thing is, it, it might. Is he dead soon? Meh. Is he going to, because he was bleeding and it, like, he was thinking like tetanus and all that. Like, regardless if he broke his glasses or not, how much longer <laughs> could Henry... How much time his, does he really have? How much have? time did he... Uh, I don't know, man. Like, I, what I got out of the story is that, yeah, he, that's still a different scene and he bandages it up. And I think those are like exaggerated fears of his if we're talking about that one point it because it implies to me like he bandaged himself he was fine like after that it wasn't mentioned after that it was like those are like oh man i cut my leg and now all these things just raced through my mind but it was it's kind of a minor point the library like, i don't know like it, it, it wasn't t- it didn't seem like to me he was crawling but like yeah it was like he was <laughs> bleeding as he was like walking towards the library i guess uh Man, this is like it is a very simple plot. I'd probably <laughs> give it a two as well, just because I like the story. Um, but that probably has something to do with having seen more of the story mm-hmm. than was originally there through the episode, and like sure, maybe course. superimposing that on this as I was reading it, right? But I, I'm not sure. So I, I'm fighting for dimensions to the story, as you can see. Yeah, like hmm. I, I don't know. Um, it's not even really an ironic. Like That's what a, I'm saying. A yeah, it's a jackass sense. genie twist. Yeah. If you like, under if you know well, what that the, means. I'm 
Trump. What I was fascinated with when I was reading it, and I'm uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to decide whether we're going into plot or themes. I'm really trying to stay away from the episode itself. But there's things in this that in the episode it takes place over a day or two, and in this it's immediate. He walks right from the bank to the library, cuts his leg en route. He's having these little flashbacks. It's very immediate. And in both cases, I think like well, the radiation won't kill you before anything else will, mm. but. <laughs> but we're, we're we're kind of taking the conceit even that, consider that yeah. But we're t- kind of taking the conceit that okay, there's no radiation on this bomb that just destroyed a city uh, or his town, whatever. Um, so the we don't know how big the bomb was really. Yeah. It was between him and the library. There's yeah, I mean, he big could, enough he could bombs walk that aren't nuclear down the road and that could be fine. Yeah, could've, possibly. Yeah, but um, we'll never know. Um, what it, but what made. Me and I'm going to give it a two without question. Um, it, it what I found interesting were those little details, like him cutting himself. The fact that like he goes to the library, that was his goal. He wasn't quite sure it was going to be there, but it's just like his lifelong goal was to go to the library. He thought it'd be the most wonderful place, you know. And, and the thing, and, and, and the thing that I love is like the little where his like wife the throws the factory. newspaper in the fire because she doesn't want him reading it. You know, after dinner, he's right. reading the paper. Mm-hmm. He's very carefully trying to find an interesting article he can quick read. And he's trying not to make any noise. She comes and throws the paper in the fire, and her first response is, "Oh shit!" The TV, the, the, the TV <laughs> schedule, uh, the TV schedule guide schedule. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, there's like little details I like, but it is a very immediate story. There isn't. It's yeah, it's kind of what I'm trying to pay, say. Yeah. yeah, so again, I agree with Scott. Um, I just it was the tiny little details in it that I liked. And that might be more style, a, you know, like well, as well in a sense. But so I mean, I'm sticking with the solid two, but I don't think I'm going to budge from there. I'm, I'm going to go with the one that from basically <laughs> is one path from uh, the bank, <laughs> the library. Sorry. Fair enough. And I like the, count the plot uh, plot threads as your score on here. <laughs> and one of the things I think is uh, was funny was um, how graphic it got. Like you know, I think 1950s everybody's gonna be kind of tiptoeing. She's kind of like, well, he, he, here's definitely the bank guy smashed into this <laughs> rubble. They, sure. Here's this carna- carnation carnation that he was wearing, and there's a couple of like little graphic things that you wouldn't always consider mm-hmm. stylistically. That's wonderful. And the sex scene. Come on. I'm yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just uh, I'm not trying to change your score. I'm just saying that there isn't much to it, but what was in there I mean I like sure. it, so. All right. What are you I'm giving it a two. Right. Okay, Ian, would you like to discuss themes? Well, the standard theme is what I already brought up with the fact that uh kind of the ironic twist of fate type thing, uh but there's a slight issue I have. Perhaps reading had more weight at that time. But <laughs> he's angry about the speed with which life is going at, and how everyone is kind of frivolously wasting like his time. You know, his boss, but mm-hmm. he, again, he doesn't dislike his boss. He admits, I get paid to be at a place. Uh, he would rather be reading, but I would rather be doing other things than being at work as well. Um, his wife, I think, is much harsher in the episode. Yeah, I guess she burns the newspaper. Uh, but for the most part, it's more of like she wants to do party things with her with the neighbors. The party people. She wants to keep up with the literal Joneses is going to be my joke. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, were their name Jones? Yes. yes. I don't remember that. That's great. But I think that he, for some reason, has an, an elevation to his pastime. And he devalues everyone else's pastimes. And... Like I'm, I'm sorry. Like you're <laughs> hanging out with people who don't like reading. Like find some time to read. Man up. Yeah. Don't um, don't wait for the end of everyone else to die in order to read. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why so, he married his wife. To be honest, go get an MLS. Seems like, work it seems like doesn't, they, uh, uh, doesn't go into those details. Sure. Yeah. Uh, again, I I don't think I mean, maybe this is going to the protagonist a little bit. Yeah, but gonna, I don't I'm think his necessarily agency in his life prior was all that strong. I think he just went with the world. And I don't, again, I don't think that it's ironic because I don't think he's a good person who's finally gotten mm. his wish. It's it's more of a, a petty person who's found, uh, who, again, who overvalues his own interests. 
That's but where I'm standing. The, the two things to what you're saying. Number one, when you brought up his boss, I thought it was funny that when a crisis happens, he's just like, he doesn't know what to do, but he's like, oh, I'll go talk to my boss. He'll know what to do. The other point is, and <laughs> this is your, to your second point, is he had made mention that he wish he'd, he has to remember to get a second pair of glasses sent to him that he's so stubborn that he won't go to another ophthalmologist because he won't trust them to cut his glasses to his specifications. So in other words, if he wasn't stubborn, I mean, there are definitely character flaws to him. In like, if he wasn't that stubborn or set in his ways or something, he would have had a backup pair of glasses that may have been home. But I'm just saying that there, there are certain aspects to his character, and I'm agreeing with you that he may not be the most completely sympathetic person. And I, I, yeah, that's true. I, I think that clearly this is a product of like a post World War II beginning of the Cold War, uh, type mentality, and I think mm. a lot of that plays into the theme of this story as well, which I think should be mentioned. I believe it was published in nineteen fifty three. Fifty three yep. is correct. Yep. So, <clears throat> um, you know, looking at it from that standpoint, I'm sure there were a lot of people thinking. Well, what if I'm the only person, you know, the, the, the same era that had um, uh, the Omega Man and mm. similar fiction to this, like, you know, if you're the last man on Earth or like um, what happens if the bombs drop and things like that. So, like, that that's definitely a theme that runs throughout this. Um, As far as what it, as far as what that theme does for the story. I think it's an interesting enough thought experiment that I am leaning towards a one, but I could definitely see myself giving this a zero as well. Um, so Ian, I know that you might try to convince me of that <laughs> if if you if you'd like to uh, take over that role right now. What's interesting to me is there's a there's a theme in here where he discusses how he's only partially read certain works and he mm. keeps. Looking at pit the pendulum is one aspect of it. You're right. Constantly mentioning that, like I've only read half of this work. I've only read, and I, that's that's a neat and potentially interesting thing to explore, which it doesn't really it sort of throws it in there. Um, again, unless you're going with these, how life is speeding up. How there's again time and evolescence right in the uh, title there, which is saying that like everything should slow down a little bit. Uh, so people have more time to like be Enjoy knowledgeable, whatever but it may be. He's not punished for his lack of knowledge. He's punished for a hap- instance of a random accident. And I don't necessarily know if I think this is as strong as it could have been, nor that was it done in the uh, Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. Now here's the thing, right? Again, I'm trying to remove as much nostalgia a from the episode itself and just look at what uh, is in the story. And see if we made a good point. Yeah, and it just happens to be like true of them couple of stories you also done recently that it's a product of its era and the mindset the cultural zeitgeist i suppose of that era it's like yeah that's gonna be there like of course by default but i like what you asked like what does it do for the story and what sort of to build on what you built on mm-hmm. like yeah i'm trying to objectively slice it up and like yes that stuff is there but what is it saying like it's more of a thought experiment kind of you said like I guess the theme or message would be like, if you want to do what you want to do, then wait for the fucking bombs to drop or some other catastrophe to happen, and then you'll have time enough less. I guess, or, but like, <clears throat> you know, what, what, like, yeah, exactly. Like, or perhaps know. it's saying, don't wait for that, right? Even, Maybe, but like, right. I mean, that was a facetious if, thing. If you're, part. I mean, actually, think about this. Let me uh, roll one in here real quick. <laughs> yeah. Think about this. If you're constantly waiting for some thing to happen that allows you to do what you want to do, you'll always be waiting and this is perhaps what the theme of this is more strongly than anything is that even when you think even even if the bombs dropped you'll find some other reason that you can't read right that you don't have time to do what you want to do uh perhaps the theme of this is to do what you want to do now and don't wait for that thing to happen that you're hoping will happen on the and uh, for that i'm going to give it a one uh because mm. I think that's a I think that's a pretty strong theme of this. Seriously, actually, right. now that you I think kinda, about it, you kind of talked me into. It. <laughs> I was going to make the argument, you know, it being it. It feels like there's more ideas, but given the fact that it was in the publication, she might have um, the, a, the a word thing or amount of space to, to physically have in the magazine. But when you brought up Pit and the Pendulum, that he never finished Pit and Pendulum, I thought of the Pendulum on a Clock. 
Mm-hmm. And then what you were saying about not waiting and that he never finished reading the pendulum clock, that he never may have considered time, you know, never. I mean, maybe I'm grasping, but I, it kind of I'm, I'm kind of working into what you were saying. And I agree with Steve. I'm, I'm going to give it a I'm going to give it a one. No, here's what I think. You're both grasping. Those are themes. Yes. But are they in the story? Is it something like it's almost like the Flannery O'Connor problem or whatever that was where one of our authors or critics was like, no, here's what you're saying. The story and, she, and whoever the author was like, nope. They're like, nope, you were wrong as the author. This is what you're saying. That was... So I don't know, like, that's an extreme example, but I feel as if you're sort of taking that angle, or at least that's how it feels to you me. It doesn't matter what the author intended. <laughs> it's what, what you get out of it. Out of sure. It. You guys grasped a one from the <laughs> void of zero. <laughs> um, I was dead set on a zero for this. but uh, I was wavering, and one. I'm probably end up with a one at the end of the day because my serious angle is like sort of tied into what the original thing we started off with is that it's a product of its time. So like, it's going to have that thematically as an element to it. I still think it works, even if that mindset has now, of course, shifted largely away from that the one at the time. I still think it's a broad enough thing that it can apply. And even if, like, yeah, your guys, like I said, I like that theme, Steve. I just don't know if the intention execution thing, but I mean, since you got that, that's fine. Well, to briefly... It's fine evidence as well. It's fine argument. To, to briefly rebut the grasping thing... I. The more I think about it, the more I think that it was intended as that, because okay. the title of the story is Time Enough at Last, and that is exactly what the theme that I was talking about is addressing. I, I get it. You know? I understand. So there's one thing we're forgetting. One line where he, he Henry Bemis throws away Spinoza. <laughs> I've heard about that. He picks up Shakespeare, but he gives Spinoza. Shakespeare, did just, yeah, did just Spinoza. I don't know enough about Spinoza. Or very uh, any, anything about it, really. I should have studied this. I sh- should have done more prep work for this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Should have read all the Spinoza books. But, um, but I- I'm assuming that's not just a coincidence. So I'm going to go in with that. There is a deeper philosophical intent to this work underpinning on, uh, a layer, uh, mm-hmm. as you mentioned. So, okay, I'm, I certainly agree. That's no accident. What, who she chose to put in there, but like I said. I was wavering this one, but you guys make, did indeed make good arguments. I sort of convinced myself. Shakespeare, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, it's all, it's all, yeah. I'm giving themes a solid one at the end of the See, day. It, and more and more. It's all there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right, cool. One's all right? Yeah. Is that true? Okay. Definitely. And Steven. Antagonist, do you have time? Um, not reading enough? <laughs> Only half reading works, uh, as we just said. Yeah, like what, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably going to give antagonist a zero in this. Like, the the bomb might be more of a protagonist than Henry Bemis. <laughs> uh, They're a buddy movie. Antagonist. It's time management. The antagonist. Time oh. management. T- time itself, time itself yeah. obviously. <laughs> time, but time isn't really the antagonist either. It is to him. Henry Bemis is the antagonist. Perhaps. Time is antagonizing him by him not having enough of it. Uh, I got, I got nothing good for this. Well, that's I what guess. I'm going with. <laughs> like, like, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's just like not having time for a very specific thing. And in his case, to read, right? But if your theme is true, then that, like, yes, that's his one. But if the antagonist is, you know, make time to do what you want to do, don't keep putting it off. Then that's still the broad subject. But of- still, time isn't the antagonist in yeah. that case. If, if, if that's your argument, because. There is time to do it. You just keep putting it off. So you're your own antagonist. But you feel antagonized by time. All right, that's my that's my argument. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. He does feel antagonized by time, but you're actually both correct <laughs> because he is antagonized by time. But it's his own fault that he's antagonized right. by time. Mm-hmm. I'll agree with that. So, of course, well said. Both time <laughs> management, as Chris as you brought up, <laughs> his priorities in life are and his choices in life Mm. are the antagonist and i guess being nearsighted myopic is also actually is myopic uh him being short-sighted and not taking time properly both uh physically and mentally boom done for one yep (laughs) i'm going with a one his own short-sightedness is the antagonist is that what you're but not his physical 
sure it's no i get i get that yeah yeah Yeah. all right i'm with you i'm uh, i'm with you on and physically projected into the space of this story i like the story more and more the the more we talk about it (laughs) me too i'm actually going back and elevating it to a two for plot Okay. Whoa, oh, nice, nice retroactive upgrade. It's been a long time. That's a rare instance, those. sir. Yes. Yeah. That's All right. awesome. All right. I am probably gonna <sighs> see now. Now I think you convinced me of giving something a one. Here. I think you should. I think you both made good arguments for the topics yeah. to each other, and I think you have to give it credit. I don't. I don't have much more to say about it, but that mm. that makes more sense than anything that I said. Mm. <laughs> no, he took both our answers, combined them, and now it equals a one, pretty much a stronger one than I was going to give it, anyways. All right. Yeah. I was back and forth on this. That was very, very good. Okay. All right. And it's to me with protagonist, which is Harry Bemis. Henry. Henry. Why did I say Harry? Because he said Harold. I I said Harold. Was it your fault, (laughs) Steve-O? Probably. You short-sighted little shit. Anyway. Uh, (laughs) Henry Bemis. Henry Bemis. Hubert Bemis. Henry. Um... I don't know what else to say. We've been... He he is the focal point of the, the, the story... Um, and, um, I think just by nature of the story, I have to give him a one, even though I'm liking him less and less, the more we talk about him. Um, he is kind of a, he is kind of a, he, he's a martyr. He's, you know, it's just like, he is a product of his own short-sightedness in, in all the things we were discussing, but by the same token, he is the protagonist. It is from his point of view, we learn everything. It's, um... You know, he is effective in that way because without him, there couldn't be a story. So mechanically, I'm going to give him a one as protagonist, even though as a character, he's becoming more grating and I'm kind of glad he (laughs) broke his glasses. Well, you have to give it a one because of everything we just said, because we basically just psychoanalyzed this character way more than is ever contained in the story. But it still somehow makes it what is in the story. I think we just you can and have extracted from it as a character. So I think he's much more complex, as you were saying, like than it seems on the surface. And yes, of course, he serves as the plot device character as well. So yeah, like I mean, that's it's it's not as funny as I'm making it out to be. I think there's something there to be said, and I think I am going to give him a one, even though I was kind of wavering on this one as well. It's just looking at the surface, but after having extracted sort of the details of his possible life and his mindset, I think he, that's why I have to give him a one. I don't think he, here's the thing: is it's interesting you said complex because he's not a complex character. In fact, he's a know. ridiculously simple character. Mm-hmm. But that's necessity to hold, uh, to bring the point home. Uh, you need to show people, mm. like, if you're so myopic so in your true. mind, you're wasting your life on all these frivolous things, that uh, you will be a Henry Bemis. Henry Bemis is not someone to look up to. He's not a He's hero. not someone you're yeah. supposed to uh, try to emulate. This is a person you're supposed to avoid. Mm-hmm. Being, and I think that makes an interesting protagonist. Mm-hmm. Uh, because again, I I I felt bad for Henry Bemis, and I don't think you're supposed to. I think you're supposed to like more pity him and look it, down yeah, upon yeah. what this character is. So yeah, I'll, I'll give that a one. Who interesting? I am probably going to give this a zero. If this was the which we are not discussing, but I'm going to briefly mention the Twilight Zone episode, right. I would probably give him a one. Because they put so much more interesting character development into him in the show. In this, you're right. He is a one-dimensional character. He has one driving factor that influences his entire life. And it's to read. I'm not sure I can give that a one. May I? Just you one may. Last thing. Perhaps... The Twilight Zone episode, which coming into this conversation, I liked a lot more than this story. Perhaps they actually ruined what this character was supposed to be by giving him more complexity, but making him a more sympathetic sympathetic character. uh, uh, uh. I mean, he wasn't that much more complex in the episode. He just had more, like, he had further characteristics. It's only because Burgess played him and he has so much uh, charisma. Right. (laughs) Well, in this one. It's not get our stuff locked down. And and he had a lot more dialogue and, like, you know, he. There was more to him. You know? But but the, the thing is, between that and this, is this is immediate. I mean, everything, it's immediate. It, basically, the bomb goes off in paragraph three, and everything else you're learning about him is his walk to the library. I especially like that, oh, the emergency said that if you don't try to call your loved ones, they're safe too. So, like, he doesn't, he's... They're as safe as you are. As safe as you are. 
which I think is funny. It's immediate because he's an immediate character. That's all yeah. he is. He can only see what's in front but, of him. Yeah, but my whole point is that's why it works in the story. Yeah. And that's my whole point. With your whole point in translating steve is that you needed that for a visual medium for, for this story because it's immediate. This is you, know, you get this much of his life from walking from the bank to the... Uh, so it's kind of like you have to translate it for each. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, you get what you need out of him. They say like no more. Like, but I don't no. think he's a strong character, which I really look for in a protagonist. Um, I see what you mean. I think he's more like, well, how we normally talk about supporting characters as set dressing. <laughs> I think he's yeah, well. kind of set dressing for this story, and for that reason, I'm going to give him Is a zero. Be cool for the themes. Yeah, exactly. And I and I like the themes, but he sort of I embodies think that the themes the theme, are really interesting. So that's why, he, but that's why my argument. I see what you mean, but he embodies it so well that like he becomes it in that sense. That's why I got to give him both a one. Sure, that's what I'm doing anyway. I mean, I'm not giving. I, I, Wait, I, I you don't got to do anything. I see I what you're saying. I see what you're saying, <laughs> yeah. but I don't. I not, not that I don't necessarily agree, but I don't think that it gets there for you. Yeah, moves okay. me to a one on protagonist. Are you sticking with the one, Ian? I am sticking with one. Okay. Uh, but I, I, I can definitely see your point. All right. All right. Scott. Yes. Supporting characters. So we've been saying this a lot, and Sivo just said the the phrase that they're basically window dressing and or just crushed Mangle's bodies, essentially. Like, his his <laughs> wife is there in a flashback, I suppose. They were window dressing, now they're... Yeah, exactly. They're all over the floor. That's what I mean. So, like, his wife is there, like... Floor dressing. Characterized briefly... As related to his one driving goal, as we just said, and how it, like he gets tripped up by that, or feels at least that it's stifling him. So again, there's not much to it. Like the rubble, you know. I mean, like it's about him. It's more of a character study, as we've been talking about, than, than it seems. So the secondary characters, whatever ones are there, are barely there at all because it focus, it centralizes on him. So I think you have to give it a default zero. You guys can try if you want to to well, give it to the other ones. I was going to add to that argument because not only are they uh, he's an unreliable narrator to those supporting characters. So you're getting his point of view. She may or may not have worried about the fact that the way it looked like she wanted to do two, two things, played cards, played charades, which is a, you know, <laughs> charades is a, yes. is a mime game and, you know, watch TV. And that her concern was taking a, a, some the written word and worrying about that, this visual medium that obviously there is a, a it seemed like he considered a lot of this stuff frivolous that um so i don't really ca- it's hard to even count the supporting characters as supporting characters That's kind of what i'm saying yeah Yeah, i mean i'm agreeing with you i'm yeah. just saying that just also given the fact that he's an unreliable narrator actually let me add one more thing i do like it's more style but even like the joke of like i said zivo their neighbors are the joneses and they have to literally keep up with them <laughs> mm. like that's what she feels like that's a funny little like thing to throw in but it's definitely styled not even characterization so and uh, to further your point uh with one last thing even the city isn't really anything right. interesting it's totally there's USA. Uh, like, not even the library particularly <laughs> yeah. is all that well like it's not interesting so there's nothing in the supporting in the setting or, yeah exactly so i'm like it's a default but definitely zero <laughs> I hate to be so disagreeable this episode. You're always um, disagreeable. Not more so than ever, I think, right now. Um, you are I think Henry that Genius. Henry Bemis is almost entirely characterized, what little characterization he has, through the secondary characters. His, like, any any insights that you gain into him are done through his reactions to things that other people... You know, in nah. his in his opinion, thrust upon him like, "Hey, come to work," and "Hey, be a good husband," and like, "Go to this party with me," or whatever. Like, I see uh, basically just his boss and his wife are really the only right. substantive secondary characters, but I see them as being the best window to who our primary character is, mm. and I think that they. I think that their role in this, in at least in terms of like what's going on or what his frame of reference is and what his frame of mind is, and like how he positions himself in the world compared to them, is the strongest indication of who he is as a character. And I think I'm going to give them a one for that. Like they're not super strong, but I think that they're strong enough to get a one. Mm, sure. Oh, sorry, I'm just going. That's really. Well put together case for sure, Steve. I like it. 
but I just, like I was gonna say, they are a window, not the only window into like his m- mental status. I guess his relationship to the world. Yeah, they're like a big one, but you also get like snippets of other things that are not necessarily set against them as characters. I mean, the other. So like, but one of the mean... other big ones is him like looking in at all the supporting characters that are doing things in the library. He's he's not looking into the, an empty library saying, sure. hey, I wish I could read all his books. He's looking in and saying, hey, I see that guy who's reading and studying. I see that person who's doing this. Like, I think all the supporting characters are the only insight into what what Bemis is in his life. I mean, you make a really good point there, but I'm still kind of mulling it over. I'm going to quote you from the protagonist that I like my supporting characters a little bit stronger. <laughs> Fair enough. That's I mean that's a fair point. The, none of them are very strong. But um I'm I'm looking at this on like how I interpreted this uh you're looking at this how through how Henry Bemis you're, you're looking at Henry Bemis through how people view him but they're viewed through Henry Bemis. So weird, right. like I, I get what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, it's like a cone of mirrors. All or roads lead yeah. back to Henry Bemis. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> of course, of course. Like there, there, well, there is nothing in this world, as shown at the end, but Henry Bemis, right? <laughs> and some books. <laughs> like, well, like, but, but he is only defined through the other characters in this story, which, like, I kind of like, and like that's going to factor into my style points as well. But, but I think that it's a strong enough point in terms of supporting characters for me to give that a one. And I completely understand if you guys don't want to give it a one for that, because I, I get that they're not super strong characters, but I think that's a really interesting take on supporting characters and the, and the protagonist. I do like that angle a lot. Like I said, and I think I'm going to do what you just said to throw it into style. Cause yeah, it's a good device, but I think I'm going to come down on East side and we sort of done this again, recently, previously before that there's not strong enough on their own to warrant a one here. Right. Because they're like sort of mirrors, as you said, into him, into and out of him, in a sense. But that's more to me. That's more of a device, Steve, like a style thing. So, and and we could talk again. I'm with you on style. Come back, come back to this. But to to a story you recommended, a uh, short story. Um, thank you. Mm-hmm. Where that was more subjective. This is more objective. You know, from his point of view, right. the the supporting characters in there independently. You know, throughout a filter were window dressing. They weren't strong enough. So I don't... Can, I, I'm just saying from my point of view, I felt even those supporting characters as window dressing as they were were a little more... These were more accents. Those were more but, like drapes. These were more like accents. I mean, I think those supporting characters played an entirely different role than the ones well, I, I agree. I'm just, like, talking, I'm just talking about in terms of their presence. That's all I was speaking right. to. Okay. That's fine. So you guys are doing zeros? I'm yeah, going to stick with a one. I will I will give you official credit that you made a really good case and a really good point, but I'm still going to have to stick with the zero. Overruled. Yeah. <laughs> Overruled. RV Birdman. I'm not going to allow it. Go on. Attorney of Ian. <laughs> Dialogue. It's not fair. <laughs> there was time now. It's not fair that there was no dialogue in this. Yeah, too bad he doesn't um, say that fucking line I was say <laughs> in the story. <laughs> um, zero. Move along. Uh, yeah, pretty much I was going to make that same <laughs> not argument statement, I suppose. There's hardly anything to it. Again, it's just there. everything that there, that dialogue is there for is to basically everything we said previously to this, mm. to, either, to either character or theme or just there to move it along, but not to like, be, be its own point. So I am also giving it sort of a default, if not like solid zero. And I'll leave it to you, Chris, if you're going to try to make it convincing case otherwise. No, I found the two lines of dialogue. Yeah. Mr. Carsville, Mr. Yeah, Carsville. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm going to get a zero. Yeah. Like his wife is in a flashback yeah. speaks to him, She's but that's, that's yeah. not much either. There's nothing uh, to it. I, I, if, if I were going to give this a one, it would all be nostalgia and I can't, I, listen, I ride nostalgia pretty hard, but, uh. <laughs> yes, that's why I have to call it out when we see it. But I can't, I can't give it that much credit. And yeah, this, there was almost no dialogue in this and, uh, you know, whatever. It was fine. It, it was, it was a very short story. There wasn't much room for nostalgia. That, I mean, nostalgia for dialogue <laughs> or nostalgia <laughs> or nostalgia. Um, yeah, there didn't no, there's plenty of room for nostalgia either. Is also, I, I mean, I, I enjoyed this story, but that doesn't mean that there was good dialogue in it. So I'm right. going to give that a zero as well. Exactly. Okay, Steve. Hmm. Style. Speaking We've been of talking about it, we keep circling. Let's go. I really enjoy the style of this story. I think it's um, it's quick. It gets right to the point. It's the 
the the problem with this is you know what's coming. If I did not know what's coming and I was reading this in 1953 or you know, yep. Even if I was late on the late on the uptake and read it in 1954, um <laughs> it would it would be I think a lot more impactful and I have to give it credit for that. Uh hmm. obviously I know what this story is. I've watched it every you know, New Year's for the last 25 years. So uh, and and there's a reason that we keep watching Twilight Zone, and especially there's a reason that this episode is is really good. It's and so this is the same basic story that's going on. Uh, as far as the prose goes, uh, I think it's an interesting. <laughs> Shut up with the rhyming, with the rhyming laughing. Uh, I I think it's an interesting way to tell a story. You know, it's it's nothing that I would consider like groundbreaking, hmm. but. It 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 moves well and it and and it keeps me interested throughout. Granted, it's pretty short, but I, I think I'm going to give Style a one. Now I'm going to give us credit for like fridge brilliance in a sense. Ian opened with a reference to an apocryphal Ernest Hemingway line. To me, this has an Ernest Hemingway esque style to it in a sense. It's very simple on its surface, but not like dumbed down. If you're not simplified, it's crisp, sort of to the point. It, it says what it says and needs to say. But no more, like not flowerly, but also again, not crudely either. It just mm. very nicely flowed, and because it's so immediate, as you were saying, Chris is a good word to describe it. It adds to that effect, I think. The simple, again, like the sentence structure, it's just there. It's describing things, but it's describing them in a, a well done way as well. And the little details are, of course, are there here and there, like the Shakespeare and the Spinoza thing. Sure. Right. They, certainly, those were chosen on purpose. And other things like that, pit in the pendulum. So yeah, yeah, like I think that's very nice, like not clipped style to it, but short. And to the point, but also sweet. So, I'm going to give it a one. I'm I'm giving it a one, and I'm going to say that my choice for reading this and other things like this, because I'm an avid science fiction fan, because you know Twilight Zone, my whole life. Also, because he's the oldest and is most susceptible <sighs> to nostalgia. I wasn't going to fucking get there, dude. Come on, I wasn't going to boast <laughs> about my my. I don't think you should boast <laughs> about it. Um, Go on. Hey, I look pretty great for my 48. Um, sure. <laughs> you decide out there. <laughs> um, go on fuck a bastard so I was like in the middle of a no about the style about the style my my whole point is it, it's like I'm always interested in going back to the source material no matter what it is mm, and sure. I want it because my whole point is and I think going back to it is more than anything my motivation to go back to it is style how is how are they conveying this fair. and in five and a half pages let's say the fact that we've talked about what we have the fact that you guys have changed my mind on a, on a couple of things. I thought I was going to give it a zeros and places. Yep, certainly. I didn't one um, says that the style of the story that she actually packed a lot, even these little details, every paragraph, there was something I thought she did a, a, a lot for very little. If she had, I wouldn't put this into a novel. I wouldn't even put this into a novella. She might be able to put it out for another 10, 15 pages, but that'd be about it. Sure. I'm going to say this one thing, and I'm sorry for this horrible pun, but the style is sort of timeless, if you will. <laughs> so you can, it can be read in any, at any point. That's all. That's my final thought on style. I have nothing to particularly add. You guys said it all. Uh, one. Going with a one, though? Yep. Okay. And it is to me to recommend, and yeah, I'd recommend Spoiler, it. Spoiler, did. I, I did I, well, yeah, I did recommend it to them. Um, I do, as I said before, have a, an ulterior motive just to go back and explore all these things. But by the same token, I enjoyed the story. It was a very short read. Um, it was from a pulp magazine from the 1950s, um, If Worlds of Science Fiction. Um, so, But it is one of those things where I, I used to read Analog growing up as a kid, and so I read great stuff. I've read Drek in five pages. Um, and it's a worthwhile story. I enjoyed it. Yeah, of course I will recommend it. Again, not, not just beyond its con uh, connection to, of course, my favorite, if not the best thing ever produced on television for half hour show. But yeah, like, and the funny thing is like, even though I love that so much, I'd never read the original source story until we did it for this. So I was glad to have done that. And yeah, I, I think you can see why it was such a good thing for them to adapt. And again, like we just said, it stands on its own. There's a lot more to it on the surface than there seems. And what it, what is there is quite significant, quite, uh, you know, has something to say. So yeah, I'll definitely recommend it. And now that I have uh, finally read it, I can say I like it even more. So, okay, okay. Um, 
So if you watched our entire review of this story, you don't need to read it. <laughs> you don't if need you to. If you like science fiction, would you, recommend you can read it. I, I, here's the problem. Okay. I recommend the... All right, this is the thing. I, like Chris mentioned earlier, I was going to give this a much lower score mm. going in. Mm. Upon discussion, I liked it a lot more. But if I was just going in with a straight recommendation, I would say watch get the Twilight Zone episode. Uh, if you want to see the source. So, I'm, again, I, I'm going to give it a zero just because I don't know if you would actually the strengths of it, yeah. the merits without for like deep analysis with other people discussing it. You will discover those merits. Hmm. Um, and, and you could discuss those same things after watching the show, too. Yeah. And the show is one of the best episodes of Twilight Zone. Like, uh, that's worth watching first. Right. But I also wanted to make I, I just want to make one point clear that I agree with you. It is one of, it is one of the best episodes of Twilight Zone. The best. Um, but I mean, I just wanted to say for for me, it was just, for me, the reason I recommend it is if, you know, as a fan of um, uh, of pulp science fiction, it was an mm-hmm. I, I was interesting, interesting way. To, my whole point is I agree with what you're saying. If you, you know, if you want the story, you could look at there. I'm just saying for my recommendation, I'm trying to, I was trying to remove it with style in this from the Twilight Zone and just say like, you know, as a piece of fifties pulp science fiction, I was curious just to read it. Yeah. Something that did inspire. Yeah, sure. I guess and, I, go ahead. Well, okay. well I mean, I was just going to, I got one more thing, but go, go, go. Well, I will say that <laughs> I, 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 I do recommend reading this. It's very short and it's a good read. And, if you know the Twilight Zone episode, which you probably do, um, you, you know you'll enjoy this. It's it's a it's it's not going to take you too long, and it'll be kind of like a trip down the memory lane that you go to every year. <laughs> sure. No, I was going to say um, that again. We sometimes do like recommended, but caveat X or whatever. It'd be like most people, as you said, are most familiar with the episode. So if they if I if someone said oh was talking to me that I said oh you know it's based on a short story they're like oh should I read it I'm like yeah it's it's still worth the read like it's not that much always different in fact it's pretty much more the same but it's still worth to read so yeah I guess I would build on what you just said said there but I do see your point about like might as well but I still recommend it at the end of the day I was telling Scott um, today at work everybody was irritating me so. I, I wanted to get away from everybody, so I went to my boss's office, locked oh, the door, and re- reread this. So it's kind of like I had a little metal experience, and <laughs> our building is basically built. Did with you say a metal drunk, experience? Meta experience. Yeah. <laughs> and both. It was both. <laughs> our building always is thumping. Sounds like it's going to fall apart. So sure. I was just going to say, I had a little meta experience with this today. He read it in a vault while reading about a guy reading in a vault and so forth. So. All right. I think that's that, that everything I... I mean, I'm Can done. Get the scores. <laughs> Want to go back? Sure. Okay. Well, uh, everyone but me gave it a seven, and because I'm the old curmudgeonly Harold, Venus, you are. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, lo- locked in the vault with my six, uh, uh, giving it an overall score of a six point seven five. That's a bit lower than I would have thought, but I think it's definitely above average. But it's still, it's still fine. I like I said, I was actually expecting it to be a lower score because I mm. was going to say mm. no fault in the story of its own. I didn't think we were going to pull as much out of it as we did. So sure. I'm actually like, okay, six and a half, seven. I think that's fair assessment. I'm going to give us in our review, of course, as always, a one because yeah, a we were able to do star. all that. Fuck yeah, yeah, man. For sure. See, if Henry Bemis just had our podcast, he would be, uh... <laughs> <laughs> He'd be entertained. <laughs> be good to go. Yep. Okay, does anybody have anything to add to Lynn Venable's Time and Effort Last? No, I think, think I've said it all. Enough. Yeah. Very good. Um, my name is Chris Morgan. I've been here with Scott Thurlow. And I can still read the large print books. Good night. Jonathan Ian Manzer. <laughs> they blew it up. God damn you. And Stephen Ramosi. It's, it's fair. <laughs> Editing and engineering by Christopher Morgan. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows, and on Facebook and Twitter for updates.